and as indicated in my letters dated 26 January 2024 and 7th March 2024, I would like to consult members on inviting the following persons to address the assembly at this meeting. Mr. Hilary Breckles, Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies and Chairman of the CARICOM Reparations Commission and Ms. Yolanda Renee King, Youth Activist. If there is no objection, may I take it that it is the wish of the General Assembly and without setting a precedent to invite these speakers to deliver statements at this meeting? I hear no objection, it is so decided. I now invite Mr. Hilary Beckles, Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies and the Chairman of the CARICOM Reparations Commission to take the floor. Mr. President, distinguished members of the General Assembly, honorable members of the King family, friends and colleagues. Mr. President, this is a, a privilege and a joy to address this August body, knowing that you, sir, Ambassador Extraordinaire, is an alumnus of the University of the West Indies, the number one university in the Caribbean, which I have the honor to lead. Mr. President, we are gathered to reflect and, and to project on this day the United Nations to set aside in remembrance of this greatest crime against humanity in this, our modern era, and indeed, arguably, in any era of human development. The transatlantic trade in the enchained, enslaved, commodified, chattelized, dehumanized African bodies. This evil enterprise by which Europe and their colonial empires devise a strategy to convert this criminality into capital the blood of African women and men, girls and boys, into a financial bonanza for the high street banks, for governments, families, churches, universities, royal families and common families, has left for us to navigate and to negotiate a legacy of human wounds still unhealed. It is now the burden of all of humanity which we must carry. It is the burden that continues to yoke all black folks who continue to suffer the aftermath of this tsunami of economic marginalization social and cultural oppression, and political victimization in their struggle for freedom with justice, and now the struggle to legitimize the reasons for reparatory justice. As I speak, Mr. President, we are 
calling for justice for the people of Haiti, who should have been held aloft for being the first nation to end the evil of slavery. They should have been held aloft for being the most noble exemplars of freedom and the celebration of democratic possibilities in Western modernity. Instead, for their audacity of action, they were punished by the Western world and demonized rather than deified. Driven by France and supported by all of Europe and the United States of America, they were forced to pay blood money in the form of reparations for having defeated their enslavers. Such examples of duplicity and mendacity in our modern world are endless in the bid to end man's inhumanity to man. Today we are called upon to bear witness once again to the methods of military barbarity and the ideologies of ethnic hatred, not only in our Americas, not only against the African people, but as we gaze upon the cruelty in Gaza. We know all too well the narrative and the tools of terror. We know these narratives, we know these institutions, and the discussions today are about colonization, racism, genocide, apartheid, infanticide, forced starvation, the animalization of images of human beings. These are all tools that we see before our very eyes as we gaze upon our televisions. These tools and narratives were honed in the cradle of Caribbean history, where the invention of the chattelization of Africans took its first root. Mr. President, I was born on the island of Barbados, which became known as the first colony in the Americas, where Africans were the majority. Barbados was also the home to the first slave code, the slave code of 1660, in which Africans were defined by law as non-humans, as property, as chattel, and as real estate. These tools were never buried, nor were they abandoned. Human decency has not been spared. History continues to haunt us in the present, and we must unite today as our foreparents united in the 19th century to end this barbarity of enslavement. We must unite today, all people of goodwill, all people with a passion for humanity at its finest, to end all massacres of innocent people whose only sin is their demand for freedom and for justice. We in the Americas and the Caribbean, we know all too well how a few hundred desperate enslaved people would rebel to preserve their dignity. But in response, the enslavers would massacre thousands for this audacity 
the principle we know very well that a few will act, but the majority will pay. As a result, Mr. President, I lay this fundamental truth upon your table this day. I do so, Mr. President, with respect to you and to this noble institution. It is this, Mr. President, that until the Western world deploys its considerable wisdom and agree to pay reparatory justly to those who have been enslaved and colonized, to pay reparatory justice for those who continue to suffer the legacies of colonization, apartheid, and slavery. Those who have survived this African Holocaust, until men and women of good conscience bring to closure the crime of enslavement in the form of apologies and development compensation, until the Western world in which we are all deeply embedded, come to realize and accept that the black people have carried for far too long the moral conscience of modernity, expressed in our terms, expressed in our time, in the superhumanity of Martin Luther King Jr and Nelson Madiba Mandela until it is recognized and accepted that only a reparatory justice framework for development can secure sustainable economic, social, and moral development. That this 21st century, threatened as we know it is, will take us back to the 16th century when these crimes against humanity were conceived and concretized. This, Mr. President, is our fear. But we are future focused. It took us all of the 19th century to uproot slavery from our civilization. Beginning with Haiti in 1804 to Brazil in 1888. It took all of that long 19th century to rid humanity of chattel slavery. Then it took us all of the 20th century, all of the long 20th century, to achieve civil rights, human rights, and nationhood for the descendants of the enslaved. But this 21st century, this 21st century, will be the century of reparatory justice. It's this century that will find and to create the greatest political movement, that is the movement for reparatory justice. As an approach to inclusive economic development, financial and economic reform, that will turn the world economy the right way up. And therefore, we will not, with our silence, allow the old persistent inequalities and the barbarity it has bred to find a new beachhead for the launch of further crimes against humanity. I wish to celebrate all of my colleague Prime Ministers of CARICOM who in their wisdom have established the CARICOM Reparations Commission with a mandate to create a dialogue for the world and how to perceive and pursue reforms to our financial institutions so that we can have justice not only for historical crimes but we can have a level playing field for the future. That is what we ask. That is what we expect. 
when I hear Prime Minister Motley of Barbados and Prime Minister Gonzales of St. Vincent and the Grenadines making this moral plea for global reform, supporting the concept of reparatory justice as a development paradigm, I feel proud to be a descendant of those enslaved people who have survived. And we take this matter very seriously. In my home island of Barbados, the British imported 600,000 enslaved Africans. A small island, 600,000 enslaved Africans over 200 years. At emancipation, there were only 83,000 remaining. How do you reduce 600,000 people to 83,000 over 200 years? Because on that island, slavery was also genocidal. So this is the moment for all good and humane citizens to join the reparatory justice movement, to come together and to heal the historical wounds that fester before our very faces. The Caribbean remains one of the few places in the world where there are still colonies. Many of the islands of the Caribbean are still colonies. Britain has colonies. France has colonies. The Dutch have colonies. Why do we have colonies remaining at this time in our history? I urge the United Nations, therefore, as part of its reparatory justice program, to recommit, to recommit to the agenda of decolonization so that this crime against humanity which began in the Caribbean can finally come to an end with the ending of colonization. The payment of moral and development reparations for the crimes against African people will at the very beginning represent the formation of a new and more equitable global order that will represent a break from historical backwardness and lay the future for the dawn of a dignified dispensation for all of humanity. This is the movement, Mr. President, that will signal finally the collective victory of humanity of good over evil. Mr. President, I thank you for your generosity. I should like to thank Professor Beckles for his statement. I would now like to invite to the floor Ms. Yolanda Renee King, youth activist. Good morning. Thank you for introducing me. I would like to express my gratitude to the President of the General Assembly, His Excellency Dennis Francis, for the invitation. It is a great honor for me to join you in commemorating this International Day of Remembrance of the victims of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. I stand before you today as the proud descendant of enslaved people who resisted slavery and racism. Like my grandparents, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King, my parents, Martin Luther King III and Andrea Waters King, have also dedicated their lives to putting an end to 
racism, and all forms of bigotry and discrimination. Like them, I am committed to the fight against racial injustice and to carrying on the legacy of my grandparents who championed social justice and equality. I am here today inspired by my grandparents to be a change maker, to make the world a better place, and to help realize my grandparents' dream. I am a proud youth activist. I am dedicated to confronting issues that challenge our world. It is up to all of us to make the world a better place. And I use my voice to encourage young people to get involved, to get informed, and to do whatever they want to make um, some change. I am appreciative of the opportunity to observe this day with you, as it serves as an important reminder of the transatlantic slave trade and the suffering that arose from it. As a descendant of enslaved people, in the family trees of both my father and mother, my ancestors were among the lucky ones who survived. March 25th is a day of reflection to remember the millions of men, women, and children who suffered and perished as a result of slavery. We are here to honor the estimated 7 million enslaved people who died aboard ships, making one of the darkest, making it one of the darkest chapters in our world history. Earlier this morning, I visited the Ark of Return, a powerful memorial that offers an opportunity to reflect on the legacy of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. It was a deeply moving and thought-provoking experience equally memorable, memorable as my first visit back in 2019. The tour reminded me that my grandfather wrote about the historical legacy of slavery in his letter from a Birmingham jail. His writings are an eloquent summation of the slavery experience in the US. It also provides a compelling testament to the faith and commitment of the victims of slavery and their descendants to rise up and claim their humanity while making their voices heard. As my grandmother, Coretta Scott King, who was an alternate United Nations delegate herself, said back in 2004, when she spoke at the Harriet Tubman Museum, the sons and daughters of the African diaspora have a moving, important, and powerful story to tell and will be heard. And then she went on to say, our African ancestors came to these shores in shackles and we were brutalized, oppressed, and suffered unspeakable cruelties for centuries. But we had something our captors could not destroy, try as they did. We had a mighty spirit that somehow overcame this terrible legacy and found noble expression in our arts and our creative efforts in every field of human accomplishment. Her words capture the stories and struggles of our ancestors whose resilience and resistance paved the way for future generations. So, it is critical that we shine a light on the past to raise awareness about the historical impact of slavery, and more importantly, its lasting effects on our society today. It is a striking reminder that we are still struggling to eradicate systemic racism, inequality, violence, and poverty that continue to affect communities worldwide. Regretfully, we cannot even say that slavery is a thing of the past. In fact, the United Nations has estimated that as many as 50 million people are victims of slavery worldwide today. And broader definitions of slavery place the number at over 100 million. As we recall the past, 
we should keep our focus on the present and the work that lies ahead. There is much work to be done. Regrettably, we are still fighting the same challenges that my grandfather gave his life fighting for and that my parents have dedicated their lives to resolving. Silence is not an opportunity for my generation. We must continue combating racism, prejudice, and discrimination in all forms by reaffirming our commitment to promoting human dignity, equality, and justice for all. My grandfather had a dream, not just for the United States, but for making the entire world a better place. He talked about creating a beloved community in which people of every race, religion, and nation could live together in peace and harmony and work together for the common progress of humankind. In his last book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community, he talked about the world house, his vision of global interconnectedness and unity in the face of challenges is still relevant today. His dream resonates deeply within me. That's why I'm committed to raising my voice to combat racism, poverty, and violence. While my family and I still to this day have talked about the correct way to be an activist, everyone can lend their own unique talents to stand up and speak out for what they believe in, to fulfill my grandparents' vision of a better world. I call on young people to lead the way. We must connect via the internet and organize across na national boundaries around the world. This will open up new possibilities for global campaigns to advance human rights and social justice in all nations. I hope that my family's legacy of social justice advocacy will inspire my generation to action and to confront issues affecting our world today. With this shared commitment, let's today affirm the bonds of interdependence that unite freedom and justice-loving people everywhere. And all of the young people in the world should embrace the future with hope, optimism, and radiant assurance that we shall overcome as sisters and brothers of all races, religions, and nations, united and determined, we will build the beloved community for all of humanity, a world house. With this vision, we can put an end to the triple evils of poverty, racism, and violence and go forward into a more hopeful future. With a fearless dedication to create a more just, compassionate, and peaceful world, the hearts and souls of millions are surely with us in this effort as we join together in common cause to create a beloved world community where peace, harmony, and goodwill will reign supreme among all creation. Inclusion, me gustaría compartir. For way of conclusion, I would like to share my final words in Spanish. Millions of hearts and souls will certainly be with us in these efforts. As we, as human beings, unite under a common cause to create a community with love, where peace, harmony, and good faith prevail throughout creation. Thank you very much. I should like to thank Ms. King for her statement. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Uganda, who will speak on behalf of the African states.
President of the General Assembly, Chef de Cabinet of the Secretary General, Your Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates. Today, as we solemnly observe the International Day of the Remembrance of Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade, we are called upon to reflect upon a profoundly grievous period in our shared history. This day is dedicated to honoring the countless individuals whose lives were irrevocably altered or extinguished by the barbaric transatlantic slave trade. The African group unites in empathy with the descendants of those who suffered through the abomination of slavery. We recognize a persistent legacy of anguish, oppression, and inequity that continues to affect communities worldwide. This commemoration compels us to face the harrowing realities of our history and to ensure that the narratives of the victims persist in our collective memory. It is imperative that we, ex we educate succeeding generations regarding the heinous acts of slavery, fostering a culture of tolerance, comprehension, and harmony among all humanity. As envoys of the African continent, we renew our pledge to eradicate the contemporary forms of slavery and trafficking in persons. We urge the global community to intensify its endeavors to eradicate the fundamental causes of these flagrant human rights abuses and to extend support and restitution to the survivors and their progeny. On this day of remembrance, let us reaffirm our dedication to the tenets of equality, respect, and justice for every individual. In unity, we commit to venerating the memories of the victims of slavery, but aspiring to a future devoid of such inhumanities. The legacy of the transatlantic slave trade and colonialism has bequeathed a profound and enduring imprint of racism, which continues to affect the lives of many descendants of the enslaved. Despite their significant contributions to the formation of societies and nations, numerous individuals of African heritage remain marginalized, hindered by racial stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination that curtails their advancement in various facets of life. They encounter barriers to equitable access to opportunities, resources, and influence, as aspirations of liberty remain intangible and the quest for justice endures. As the United Nations gears up to implement measures aimed at blostering global governance at the forthcoming Summit of the Future, it is incumbent upon member states, intergovernmental organizations, and civil society actors to also undertake initiatives that promote equity and impartiality in decision-making. Such efforts are crucial to effecting transformative change that will contribute to the eradication of racism and the advancement of justice and the realization of freedom for all. Thank you for listening. I thank the distinguished representative of Uganda and now invite the distinguished representative of Bahrain who will speak on behalf of the Asia Pacific States. I have the honor to deliver the statement on behalf of the group of Asia Pacific States. At the outset, I would like to thank His Excellency Mr. Dennis Francis, President of the General Assembly for convening this plenary meeting to commemorate the International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade. Mr. President, the group of Asia Pacific States joins the Assembly once again this year to honor the victims of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. The transatlantic trade in trafficked and enslaved Africans represents one of the most horrific and traumatizing eras in human history. Today, the legacies of racism and prejudice left behind by slavery and the transatlantic slave trade persist and continue to affect people of African descent. The theme of this year's observance, creating global freedom, countering racism with justice in societies and among nations, underscores that justice is crucial to acknowledge the fundamental dignity, equality, and the rights of people of African descent. The international community 
must step up its efforts to address social and economic inequalities, hatred, racism, and prejudice to advance the cause of global freedom. To that end, the Asia Pacific Group reaffirms the importance of educating and informing current and future generations about the causes, consequences, lessons, and legacy of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade, as well as the right to seek just and adequate reparation, remedy, or satisfaction. We acknowledge the efforts made to date to raise public awareness on the subject, but more needs to be done. The permanent memorial to honor the victims of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade here at the United Nations, the Ark of Return, serves as a reminder that we must remain committed to our responsibility to promote tolerance, justice, and human dignity. The Asia Pacific Group stands in unity to strive for the elimination of racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance in all its forms, as well as the eradication of modern day slavery. Mr. President, the Asia Pacific Group remains concerned by the scourge of modern slavery and in reaffirming its commitment to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, calls on the international community to redouble efforts to eradicate forced labor and end modern slavery, human trafficking, and child labor in all its forms. We must continue to act in line with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which declares no one shall be held in slavery or servitude and that slavery and the slave trade shall be prohibited in all their forms. It is also important to renew our commitment to our obligations under international law, including international human rights instruments on combating racism and racial discrimination. To conclude, Mr. President, as we honor the memory of the victims of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade, let us remind ourselves of our greater commitment to social justice and human dignity. Thank you. I should like to thank the distinguished representative of Bahrain. And now invite to the floor the distinguished representative of Guatemala, who will speak on behalf of the Latin American and Caribbean group. Mr. President, I have the honor to deliver this statement on behalf of the group of Latin American and Caribbean states, GRULAC. At the outset, please allow us to express our gratitude for convening this important commemorative plenary meeting, which provides the unique honor of reinforcing the value of protecting the international community today and in the future from wrongs of the past. We also wish to thank Mr. Cortene Ratray, Chief of Cabinet, Professor uh, Hilary Bettles, sir, and Mrs. Yolanda Rene King for participating in this meeting. Gracias. Mr. President, today we are called to reflect on the abolition of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade through the prism of the theme, creating global freedom countering racism with justice in societies among nations. In doing so, we honor and remember the more than 15 million African women, men, youth, and children who were brutally forced from their homes, families, communities, countries, and way of life. This is also an occasion to address the intergenerational legacies that remain from that hideous and dark period of human history. Today, we commemorate the victims of a global system of exploitation and dehumanization, which engendered unprecedented wealth for many nations, while begetting death and intergenerational trauma. May we also honor the indigenous peoples who also suffer and lost their lives from the immoral an unforgettable slave trade. We cannot forget the history of colonization and the legacy of colonialism in our region. Mr. President, the damage wrought by this institutionalized exploitation based on racism, exploitation and torture continues today in the form of racism, hate speech, 
and malignant prejudices in beliefs and actions from subtle to grotesque forms of violence and microaggressions, which continue to adversely impact the people of African descent across the world today. As this year's theme centers on access to justice, ensuring accountability and the promotion of truth, reparation and guarantees of non-recurrence are critically to combat one of the legacies of slavery, racism and to uproot racial and false narratives. We echo the call of the Secretary General for Reparatory Justice as a crucial element to realize racial equality and atone for the enduring repercussions of centuries of enslavement and colonialism. Moreover, we call for further efforts by member states to incorporate a comprehensive understanding of the legacy of the transatlantic slave trade into educational curricula. We must educate and raise awareness on the history of the slave trade system as a means to address its legacy and fight racism, racism today. Much of who we are as a people and a society is owed to the generations of people of African descent who have shaped the communities and formed the identities of the peoples of the Americas and the Caribbean. And today we pay tribute to their immeasurable contributions to our region. Mr. President, despite the abolition of slavery, people of African descent across the Latin American and Caribbean region and the world at large continue to grapple with the racial, ethnic, gender, economic, social, and political hierarchies established in its inst institutionalization. Even worse, numerous forms of slavery still exist today, experienced by millions of people across the world, such as forced labor, domestic servitude, debt bondage, child early and forced marriage, sexual slavery, recruitment of child soldiers, and human trafficking, including the trafficking of persons for removal of their organs. After four centuries of the transatlantic slave trade, currently there is still a high number of people in modern day slavery. Estimates by ILO reveal that forced labor and forced marriage have increased significantly in the last five years. 10 million more people were said to live in modern slavery in 2021 compared to 2016, global estimates bringing the total to an approximate 50 million worldwide. This number translates to nearly one of every 150 people in the world. Unfortunately, the scourge of modern slavery has by no means been relegated to history. Women and children remain disproportionately vulnerable to exploitation through modern forms of slavery. Mr. President, we must take collective action to dismantle the transnational criminal structures that sustain these and other forms of exploitation and subjugation. We consider the establishment of the Permanent Forum for People of African Descent in 2021 as an important step in this regard. We continue to affirm our support to its initiatives and mandate in order to improve the safety, quality of lives, and livelihoods of people of African descent. We look forward to the upcoming third session of the Permanent Forum in April 2024 in Geneva. There is still much work to be done to achieve the full equality of every individual in our region and globally. It is imperative that we take progressive steps towards the achievement of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the implementation of the Durban Declaration and Program of Action. As the International Decade for People of African Descent concludes this year, the group reiterates its support for proclaiming a second International Decade for People of African Descent starting in 2025 with the aim of maintaining the highest political attention to our commitments of recognition, justice, and development, assuring the promotion and protection of human rights for all. Mr. President, the lessons of yesterday should urge each of us to address the evil 
of modern day slavery. And in doing so, we must always remember to honor the victims of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade, while also embracing this momentous occasion as a dynamic call to protect our communities from contemporary forms of slavery today. Thank you, Mr. President. I should like to thank the distinguished representative of Guatemala. And I now invite the distinguished representative of Germany to take the floor, speaking on behalf of the Western European and others group. Mr. President, the Chef de Cabinet of the Secretary General, Mr. Courtney Ratnay, Sir Hilary Beckles, Mrs. King, distinguished delegates, I have the honor to speak today on behalf of the Western European and other states group on the occasion of the International Day of Remembrance of the victims of slavery and transatlantic slave trade. Today we remember the millions of people, men, women, and children, who became victims of slavery and did not survive the unfathomable brutality of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. The transatlantic slave trade remains an unparalleled tragedy which lasted for over three centuries and involved unspeakable atrocities and the enslavement of millions of Africans of whom many died during the horrific journey across the Atlantic. We pay tribute to the countless victims of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade, and we pay respect to their descendants. The stories of those who were forcibly abducted from their homelands and sold as slaves, the stories of those who fought bravely against their oppressors and against the cruel practices of slavery must not be forgotten. We need to continue to educate everyone on the history of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade and about their devastating consequences and long lasting impacts. We also consider it vital to shed a light on the rich heritage and the important contributions of people of African descent and we pay tribute to their many achievements in all areas of our societies. The wrongs of the past cannot be undone but we can learn from them for the present and the future and try to redress the still continuing effects by acknowledging and addressing the trauma caused by them. We also need to remove barriers and tackle disparities that still represent an obstacle to the equal participation in all spheres of society by the descendants of those affected by the monstrous and utterly dehumanizing acts of slavery and transatlantic trade. Racism against people of African descent is in part a lasting legacy of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. We stay committed to addressing its root causes and take concrete action to prevent and eliminate racial discrimination and to fight racism, xenophobia, and related intolerance. To that end, we renew our commitment to the full an effective implementation of the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination and take note of the Durban Declaration and Program of Action. This day should also remind and encourage us to act in line with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, which provide that no one shall be held in slavery or servitude and that slavery and slave trade shall be prohibited in all their forms. But even today, we see traffickers exploit and profit at the expense of adults and children by forcing them to perform labor or engage in commercial sex. While women and girls account for the majority of identified victims to these horrible practices, many more individuals, including men and boys, are also impacted by these too often hidden crimes. 
It is essential that we comply with our obligations under international law, including the convention to suppress the slave trade and slavery. We call on states that have not done so to ratify the United Nations Convention Against International Organized Crime and its trafficking protocol and to effectively implement them. We welcome current efforts to considering a Rome Statute Amendment inclusive of slave trade, as well as a distinct provision in the draft articles on the prevention and punishment of crimes against humanity. We must increase our efforts to eliminate all forms of trafficking in persons as committed in the 2030 Agenda, and to ensure justice, accountability, dignity and freedom for all persons. I thank you. I should like to thank the distinguished representative of Germany for his statement. And I now invite to the floor, I would like to inform the assembly that I've received requests from additional member states to speak in this commemorative meeting. I now therefore give the floor to the distinguished representative of AT, who will speak on behalf of the Caribbean community. Mr. President, I have the honor to deliver this statement on behalf of the Caribbean community, CARICOM. At the outset, CARICOM aligned itself with the statement delivered by the distinguished representative of the Latin American and Caribbean groups of state. We express our sincere appreciation to the President of the General Assembly, His Excellency Denis Francis, for convening this commemorative plenary meeting to mark the International Day for the Remembrance of the Victim of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade. We also thank Professor Sir Hilary Beckers, the son of Barbados, and Mrs. Yolanda Rene King for their contribution to this meeting. Mr. President, for many years, Caribbean voice have echoed throughout the chambers and halls of the United Nations in honoring the victims of these past atrocities, as well as raising awareness of and advocating against the legacies of slavery and systemic underdevelopment of people of African descent. Not only is this our right, it is also our solemn duty so long as inaction and indifference to the wrongs committed in the past persist. As the UN contemplates the theme of this year's commemoration, creating global freedom, countering racism with justice in society and among nations, CARICOM is compelled to assess the concept of freedom comprehensively. Slavery in the Caribbean was first abolished in Haiti in 1804 and across the wider region 30 years later. The historic books will say that by virtue of this decree, slaves were granted freedom from which their descendants benefit today. Yet, for a great many citizens of the Caribbean community who are people of African descent, they are a constant reminder of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade as the residual effects are manifested in our daily lives, including in the form of high national debt, poverty, and institutional deficiencies and inefficiencies. After almost 200 years since our ancestral freedom, it is clear that not all are granted the essential freedom to achieve the inalienable right of every human being. The artificial barrier of racism and discrimination between and among nations continue to propel injustice and underdevelopment. Indeed, there is something fundamentally wrong with a global economy 
that is aimed on the system of self-perpetuating poverty, one which stipulated that the more in debt you are and the poorer you are, the, most, the more expensive it should be to meet your needs. For this reason, CARICOM is of the view that the key to successfully combating injustice and truly attaining freedom is equity. To achieve equity, there must be a reform of the international financial architecture to include the private sector, where the bulk of opportunity for investment currently lie. The complete reform of global governance is also necessary to prevent the use of unilateral coercive measures and to allow all nations, big and small, to achieve the sustainable development goals and fulfill the human right of their citizens. These reforms are welcomed avenue toward achieving global socioeconomic equity, even as CARICOM countries continue our pursuit of reparatory justice and to engage the international community on the pragmatic ways in which this can be achieved. Mr. President, CARICOM is intent on profoundly addressing the issue of reparatory justice within our region and most certainly within the context of the United Nations. We therefore call on all member states to join in these efforts to acknowledge the embedded institutional, human, and emotional harm caused by slavery and the need for restoration. On this commemorative occasion, CARICOM also calls on the international community to demonstrate through the way in which we address the challenge in Haiti, that we are able to rise above the shackles that have held us as a global community back in the past. Monsieur le Président. Mr. President, I now wish to continue my statement in my national capacity. It is with a feeling of pride that I take the floor today on this day to commemorate the General Assembly commemoration of the International Day to commemorate the victims of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. This event is of paramount importance for my country. Haiti, the first black republic of the world, born of the successful unique slave result, revolt, which radically altered the course of human history. This symbolizes not just the fierce struggle of our ancestors for freedom, equality, human dignity, but also their invaluable contribution to the abolition of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade which constituted the vastest forced displacement of persons decimating the nations of Africa, the consequences of which continue to reverberate in our societies through racism, xenophobia, and prejudice of all sorts. For Haiti, today is not just a moment to recall our ancestors, victims of the brutality of slavery and the African slave trade, but this is also an opportunity to reaffirm our unstinting commitment to their respect of human dignity, the self-determination of peoples, and the individual freedoms which are enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. For us, the Haitian people, this is an also this is also a moment of reflection, of inspiration, a reminder that our country, despite the challenges which we currently face, has the foundation to surmount the adversities which we face and to build a prosperous future for future generations. We stand before you today not as victims resigned to accept our deplorable condition. We stand before you as witnesses with the strength in our ability to change our destiny and aspire to a better future. President, present day Haiti is fading, facing myriad challenges, testing our resilience, our un unity and our humanity. Nonetheless, the fighting spirit of our ancestors resonates within us more than ever before. This is a reminder of the fact that contrary to 
any expectations. Facing the greatest adversity, Haiti managed to rise to the level of a leading bastion of freedom in a new world, the first to shatter the chains of slavery and to proclaim our sovereignty and independence. This uh, is a spirit of courage, ingenuity, and determination, this spirit continues to live within us as descendants of these valiant revolutionaries. We hold within us the flame of rebirth and renewal. Like our ancestors who rose up to forge a better future for our nation, we too shall rise to rebuild our nation, which has been ravaged by the violence of armed gangs. Haiti will be reborn from the ashes, not despite the challenges we face, but through them, drawing our strength from the perseverance, resilience, which define our people and constitute the bedrock of our ability to extricate ourselves from this multifaceted crisis. The world needs to know that Haiti is not simply a nation locked in a struggle. We are a people who have aspirations. We dream to better futures, to build our future, to achieve this. The legacy of our founding fathers, our unshakable future in a better future fuels our quest for justice, equality, and prosperity for all Haitian people. In solidarity, in unity, and with the support of the international community, Haiti will once again rise up, standing as a testament of the indomitable strength of our determination to achieve great feats of our predecessors. May God help us to achieve this. Thank you. I should like to thank the distinguished representative of Haiti for his statement speaking on behalf of CARICOM. And I now invite the distinguished representative of Equatorial Guinea to take the floor. Excellent. Excellency, Mr. Dennis Francis, President of the General Assembly. Excellency Ratri, head, head of cabinet, and ladies and gentlemen, my statement is aligned with the statement made by Uganda on behalf of the African group. President. According to UNESCO estimates, between 15 and 20 million Africans were kidnapped and transported against their will from Africa to North America, Central America, South America and the Caribbean. Many of them died during their transfer to the Americas. This massive deportation and the resulting slavery is considered as one of the worst violations of human rights in the whole history of humankind. According to some experts, its effects still persist in African economies and its racist legacy continues to have repercussions to this day upon Afro-descendants across the world. President, as we commemorate on the 25th of March, this day of the victims of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade, whose theme this year is creating global freedom, countering racism with justice in societies and among nations. This must be a day for profound reflection and a retrospective examination of the sad and shameful trade inflicted upon Africans over centuries, that is, the slave trade. This is a great violation of human rights, which became a lucrative multinational operation. Some of the practices of the African slave trade were even legalized in some countries. The transatlantic slave trade caused immeasurable suffering. Every single one of the millions and millions of individual victims had 
a history, a family, dreams and hopes. Indeed, President, the African slave trade lay at the heart of deep structural inequalities at economic and social levels. These injustices and inequalities still affect black people and Afro descendants today throughout the world, as we have seen and are still seeing in the major crises which occur in our world. Black people have always been discriminated against and this is in a world where there is so much talk of the obligation to respect human rights and humanitarian rights. President, those human beings who succumbed under the yoke of slavery had scant refuge. They were left with their beliefs, their drums, their invincible, de invincible determination not to die. They ran the risk of losing their identity and their very reason to live. Upon this day of the remembrance of the slave trade, uh, victims of slavery in the transatlantic slave trade, the Republic of Equatorial Guinea pays the highest of tributes to the courage of the almost five million black men and women who fell under the yoke of slavery. And we applaud their courage. We applaud Toussaint Louverture. We applaud Aimé Césaire, the Maroons the brave combatants of Jamaica, Haiti and Peru, those from all of the African diaspora who stood up to ignominy against the ills related by Emi Césaire in his notebook of a return to the native land. On this day of remembrance of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade, we also salute the memory of those who fought against this terrible crime against this serious intolerance, against this ignoble injustice and against this flagrant violation of human rights. We laud those who through their own creativity contributed to this fight. We laud in this way the architect Rodney Leon who designed and built the Ark of Return which is a permanent mem memorial to the victims of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade, and it stands on the esplanade of this United Nations headquarters. For the construction of this sculpture, His Excellency the President of the Republic of Equatorial Guinea, Obiang Ngema Mabesongo, made a significant contribution. To conclude, President, during the 37th meeting of the African Union in Addis Ababa on the 17th to 18th of February this year. His Excellency Nana Akufo Addo, President of the Republic of Ghana, presented the report of the International Conference on Building a United Front to Advance the Cause of Justice and Reparations to Africans. Amongst the recommendations of this report, I wish to underscore declaring the year 2025 as a year of justice for Africa through reparations. And secondly, that African states continue to face the repercussions of the transatlantic slave trade, colonialism and apartheid. Through the persistence of neo-colonialism and dependence on former colonial powers. Therefore, immediate, just and exhaustive reforms are required to the prevailing architecture of multilateral institutions through the full implementation of the related shared African positions. In particular, with regard to the composition and working methods of the United Nations Security Council and the Bretton Woods institutions, as well as guaranteeing an equitable and just international system through tangible measures, which include inter alia, special and differentiated treatment, shared but differentiated responsibilities and mechanisms for losses, loss and damages, as well as debt relief, the reduction of illicit financial flows and the return of African cultural goods. President, I conclude my statement by underscoring the fact that we are all part of the same family, a great family, 
which is the family of humanity, of humankind. In this great family, there should be no space for any degrading, degrading or discriminatory treatment for any of its members. All together, President, from the Caribbean, from Africa, from the whole of the world, let us all say, let us all clamour, let us all sing, never again, never again. And may racial discrimination, supremacies, and the treatment of black people as inferior beings cease. We all belong to the great family of humankind. I thank you. I should like to thank the distinguished representative of Equatorial Guinea. And, and I now invite to the floor the distinguished representative of the host country, the United States. Good morning, Mr. President, and thank you to members of the King family for being here with us this morning. Dr. King's legacy continues to inspire us all. Thank you, Mr. President, for convening us to mark the International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade. Today, we reflect on one of the darkest chapters in human history, when women, men, and children were ripped from their homes in Africa and sold into chattel slavery. Tens of millions of people exploited and dehumanized, beaten and brutalized over the course of centuries. Here in the United States, we often just see slavery as a problem of the South, but slavery was also a fixture of the North, of this very city. New York City was used as a port in the transatlantic slave trade and by the mid 18th century, roughly one in five people in Manhattan were enslaved. When you walk down Broadway, you are walking down a street that was cleared and cut by enslaved people. And when you're on Wall Street, it's very possible you'll pass the very spot where a slave market once stood. Colleagues, we must remember the full history of slavery here in New York, across the United States, across the hemisphere, and around the world. But today cannot just be about remembering, it also has to be about reckoning, about reckoning with the lasting pernicious legacy of the transatlantic slave trade and colonialism, about reckoning with the devastating, often deadly consequences of anti-black racism about reckoning with the ways systemic race system undermines development, peace, democracy, and the rule of law. We must face these painful realities head on. This is the only way to remove the rot of systemic racism from our societies. The Biden-Harris administration is fully committed to this work at home and abroad. On day one, President Biden signed an historic executive order that acknowledged the unbearable human costs of systemic racism and directed our federal government to advance equity for those who have been historically underserved, marginalized, and affected by persistent discrimination, poverty, and inequality. In December 2022, President Biden also established the President's Advisory Council on African Diaspora Engagement, which seeks to advance inclusion, belonging, and public awareness of the diversity, accomplishments, culture, and history of the African diaspora. And here at the UN, we are proud champions of the Permanent Forum on People of African Descent. We were the only country that made a voluntary contribution to support the historic launch of the Permanent Forum last year. Colleagues, the legacy of the transatlantic slave trade is very much still with us, and it can be felt around the world. And so we all have a responsibility to reckon with hard truths and together forge a better future for our children, for our grandchildren, for the generations yet to be born. Let us recommit to stamping out systemic racism in every corner of the world. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
I should like to thank the distinguished representative of the United States. And I now invite the distinguished representative of Nigeria to take the floor. Mr. President, Excellencies, and dear colleagues, my delegation aligns itself with the statement delivered by Uganda on behalf of Africa Group, and would like to make the following remarks in our national capacity. Nigeria underscored today as a sober reflection and poignant reminder of this dark chapter in human history and its lasting effects on our societies worldwide. It is a day to honor the resilience and culture of the victims of slavery and transatlantic slave trade, as well as recommit to combating racism, prejudice, and other related intolerance. People of African descent are proportionately impacted by the burden of poverty, driven by the transatlantic slave trade, slavery, and colonialism. These have led to structural and institutional discrimination including many human rights denied actions, such as segregation, limited access to education, other social services, and employment. In this regard, understanding the past is crucial to preventing future injustices and promoting harmony. Mr. President, Nigeria is concerned about the alarming manifestations of racism racial discrimination, and xenophobia and other related intolerance against people of African descent. The problem manifests locally, nationally, and globally. As such, each level has clear responsibilities for restitution. It is imperative to emphasize that only people of African descent were not given required reparation as was given to other races. We call on United Nations as a multilateral platform through the reparatory framework to demand for the appropriate reparation for the people of African descent for the pains of slavery and transatlantic slave trade. We are convinced that the United Nations General Assembly Resolution 75-314, which institutionalized the permanent forum of people of African descent for improving the safety and quality of life and livelihoods of people of African descent as well as an ad advisory body to the Human Rights Council have to protect human rights of African people. It is fully in tandem with the Durban Declaration and Program of Action and reaffirms the principles and purposes of the Charter of the United Nations, the Uni Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Rac Racial Discrimination. It is a promotion of the Sustainable Development Goals. We need to have disaggregated data so that we can have better clarity on systemic racism, its causes, consequences, and to be able to better monitor the effectiveness of policy measures. In this regard, member states are encouraged to use appropriate disaggregated data to ensure that policies are better designed and monitored for their inclusivity. It is imperative to state that perpetrators of racism and racial discrimination must be held accountable. Beyond the law enforcement approach, however, dealing with the foundations of this socio-political economy of racial discrimination in a holistic manner is crucial to finding lasting solutions to the situation. As a matter of universal importance, multilateral cooperation in dealing with the threat posed by racial discrimination and related intolerance is required. We call on the UN member states to consider innovative ways of destroying the structural foundations of racism, racial discrimination, and other related intolerance, which have proven to be obstacles to the enjoyment of human rights by, by the people of African descent. In conclusion, Mr. President, International Day of Remembrance of Victims of Slavery and Transatlantic Slave Trade is more than a day of remembrance. It is a call to action. It challenges us to confront our past, learn from it, and build a future grounded in respect, dignity, and equality. Collaboration between member states, 
and the United Nations is vital. Nigeria stands ready to work with all in this regard. I thank you. I should like to thank the distinguished representative of Nigeria. We have heard the last speaker in this commemorative meeting. The assembly has thus concluded its commemorative meeting to mark the International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade. May I take it that it is the wish of the General Assembly to conclude its consideration of Agenda Item 118? It is so decided. The General Assembly will resume its consideration of Agenda Item 14, entitled Culture of Peace to Take Action on a Draft Resolution contained in Document A-78-L53. Before we proceed to take action on the draft resolution, I should like to inform members that the Assembly will hold a debate on this item at a later date to be announced. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Vietnam to introduce draft resolution A stroke 78 stroke L53. Mr. President, on behalf of Bulgaria, El Salvador, Kenya, Jamaica, Luxembourg, and Vietnam, I have the honor to introduce draft resolution A slash 78 slash N53, by which the General Assembly would proclaim June 11th as the International Day of Play to be commemorated every year. Play is not merely a leisure activity, but a vital component of human development across all ages that contributes to the holistic growth individuals across cognitive, so social, emotional, and physical domains. 